Welcome. I'm Dr. Owen Anderson, and we're looking at John Locke's The Reasonableness of Christianity. Is Christianity reasonable? Uh, reasonableness has a kind of subjective feel to it. Like what a, a person finds reasonable depends on a lot of other things about them, which may or not reflect reality. So they might find something reasonable, which in fact isn't rational. So already we might have a question in our mind, wait, what is this reasonableness? Maybe it's reasonable to some people, but it's not reasonable to others. So we're going to look at specifically what he thinks, not, not the whole book, but the first parts of it where he's teaching what is the essence of Christianity. So he's going to talk about the reasonableness of Christianity as developed in the scriptures. And then we're really looking at this first part, the reasonableness of Christianity as developed in the scriptures, a vindication of the reasonableness of Christianity from uh, Mr. Edwards' reflections pages 8 through 97, in there is where you're going to really get um, the essence of Christianity. And it's summarized this way in his second part, that nothing is required to be believed by any Christian but this, that Jesus is the, is the Messiah. That's all. Now, that way you're wondering, well, what do you have to believe about Jesus or who he is and what it means to be the Messiah? So I really kind of get into that here in the first part that we're looking at. This is kind of a nice uh, PDF that has all of these for us laid out. Scroll down. I hope that doesn't make you too dizzy to the beginning. And we're going to see, he says he's been doing attentive and unbiased research that he's going to show us the reasonableness of Christianity. Now, I remind you that he's living just after the English Civil War, which was a religious civil war in England, and his parents were involved in that. So his upbringing and his formative years will be shaped by thinking about how religious groups, both Christian, had been killing each other and how Christianity is not meant for that kind of thing. So it is obvious to anyone who reads the New Testament that the doctrine of redemption and consequently of the gospel is founded upon the supposition of Adam's fall. Okay, not a bad start. Redemption presupposes sin, and that sin in me now presupposes the origin of sin all the way back. So, okay, and, and that there was an Adam who fell. So to understand, therefore, what we're, that we're restored, or what we are restored to in Jesus Christ, we must consider what the scriptures show we lost in Adam. So there's a connection. Jesus is not just a great teacher who gives us some information. He restores to us something that was lost by Adam. And so this I thought worthy of a diligent and unbiased search, since I found the two extremes that men run to on this point. Either on the one hand, they shook the foundations of all religion, or on the other, made Christianity almost nothing. For while some men would have all of Adam's posterity doomed to eternal infinite punishment not sure what that means un unending for the transgression of adam whom millions have never heard of and no one had authorized to transact for him or be his representative this seemed to others so little consistent with the justice or goodness of the great and infinite god they would have thought there was no redemption necessary and consequently that there was none so there's two extremes on the one hand some person adam who you've never heard of and you never voted for, represented you, and now you're condemned to hell. The other guy says, that is so ridiculous. And contrary to the, the goodness of God, the whole story is false. You don't need redemption of that kind. So we're going to get it and see how does he develop and understand, understand this. And, and that second view makes Jesus Christ just the restorer and preacher of pure natural religion, thereby, thereby doing uh, violence to the whole tenor of the New Testament. So that's, that's been a view, right? That Jesus is just a great teacher who came along and taught us 
truths we need to know. But he's not the son of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he says, if you do an unbiased reading of scripture, that Adam fell from, uh, is a visible, was the state of perfect obedience, which is called justice in the New Testament, though the word, which in the original signifies justice, be translated righteousness. And by this fall, he lost paradise, wherein was tranquility and the tree of life, which is physical immortality. The penalty annexed to the breach of the law, with a sentence pronounced by God upon it, shows this. So the penalty is, in the day you eat, you'll surely die. Now, how was this executed? Kind of a weird word. How was the penalty of surely die executed? Uh, well, he did eat. But in the day he, he ate, he did not actually die. Interesting. But was turned out of paradise from the tree of life and shut out of it forever, lest he should take part thereof and live forever. So this shows, according to Locke, that the state of, of paradise was a state of immortality, of life without end, which he lost the very day that he ate. So the day we will surely die is losing physical immortality. His life began from thence to shorten and waste and to have an end, and from thence to his actual death, which means Christianity is going to restore us to physical immortality. So death then entered and showed his face, which before was shut out. So as what says, in Adam all die, physical death. So this is so clear in these cited places and so much the current of the New Testament that nobody can deny but that the doctrine of the gospel is that death came on all men by Adam's sin. Okay, yes, this is a good example of us, for us of how to interpret scripture. It's so clear that death came on all men by Adam's sin. That is taught. But as we just saw, what is meant by death might have different understandings. We're going we're to see what he says about it. And he says that they differ about the signification of the word death, even though that's clear. For some will have it to be a state of guilt, where not only he, but all his posterity were so involved that everyone descended of him deserved endless torment and hellfire. I shall say nothing more how far in the apprehension of men this consists with the justice and goodness of God, having mentioned it above. But it seems a strange way of understanding a law which requires the plainest and directest words that by death should be meant eternal life and misery. Could anyone be supposed by a law that says, for felony thou shalt die, that he should lose his life and be kept alive in perpetual exquisite torments? So here we have a little bit of an argument also about against unending hell from Locke. It's against the plain meaning of the words, and it's against the goodness of God. So he's giving an argument here to say death must mean physical death. To this, they would have it also a state of necessary sinning and provoking God in every action that men do. So after the fall, men are sinning out of necessity. God says that in the day you eat of the fruit and fruit, you shall die. Thou and thy posterity shall be ever after incapable of doing anything but what shall be sinful and provoking me and shall justly deserve my wrath and indignation. That's not what it says, is what he's pointing out. Could a worthy man be supposed to put such terms upon the obedience of his subjects? So here he's now also uh, raising questions about the idea of the of uh, total depravity, saying that's not a reasonable view. Okay, so what is reasonable? Now, another part of the sentence was this. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground, for out of it were taken. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. This shows that paradise was a place of bliss as well as immortality, without drudgery and without sorrow, but when man was turned out, he was exposed to the toil, anxiety, and frailties of this mortal life, which should end in the dust. So that's going to be what we're restored from. Mostly natural evil. Death, 
and the frailties of this physical life are the punishment which Jesus restores us out of. So as Adam was returned, was turned out of paradise, so all his posterity were born out of it, out of the reach of the tree of life, all like their father in the state of mortality. So it's not that they were born sinners and every action of theirs is a sin, but that they were born without access to the tree of life. So by one man, sin into the world and death by sin. But here will occur the common objection that so many stumble at. How does this consist with the justice and goodness of God? That the posterity of Adam should suffer for his sin. Very well, he says, if keeping one from what he has no right to be called a punishment, the state of immortality in paradise is not due to the posterity of Adam more than to any other creature. So God doesn't have to make anyone immortal. Interesting. He's suggesting then that God could create humans mortal, and that's not contrary to his justice. Nay, if God afford them a temporary mortal life, tis his gift. They owe it to his bounty. They could not claim it as their right. And so you have some things mixed up in there where you say, yeah, that's true. Existence is a gift of God, but God also can't create evil. And death is evil. God made the world very good without death in it. So he's saying now death could have been original. He had taken from man, had he taken from mankind anything that was their right? Or did he put men in a state of misery worse than not being without any fault or demerit of their own? This indeed would be hard to reconcile with his justice. But that's not what has happened. He says, uh, that such a state of extreme, irremediable torment is worse than no being at all, if, if everyone's own sense did not determine against the vain philosophy and foolish metaphysics of some men, yet our Savior's peremptory decision has put it past doubt, that one may be in such an estate that it had been better for him not to have been born. So he's going to suggest that not existing is less of a, a, a misery than these estates and, and, and perhaps suggest that when you die physically apart from Christ, you don't exist anymore. So his solution to the problems is this. All die in Adam, but none are truly punished but for their own deeds. Because the physical death is not punishment. He doesn't get to it being a call back. The physical death is an original and it's not punishment. It's a call to stop and think about sin. So he says, there is no condemnation for anyone for what his forefather Adam had done, which is not likely should have been omitted, omitted, if that should have been a cause why anyone was adjudged in the fire with the devils and his with the devil and his angels. So no one's condemned due to Adam. They're condemned due to their own sin. So against total depravity, against original sin, and yet trying to keep the original Adam, not as a representative in the sense of because he fell, we're fallen, but in the sense of his choice got us cast out of the garden, and now Christ is going to get us back into the garden. So Adam, being thus turned out of paradise and all his posterity born out of it, the consequence of it was that all men should die and remain under death forever and so be utterly lost. Physical death. From this estate of death, Jesus Christ restores all mankind to life. Quote, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. How shall this be? The same apostle tells us in the foregoing verse 21. So they, they recover from death, which otherwise all mankind should have continued under, lost forever. Now, when you have this view of Christianity, you can be, begin to see how it solves other problems, like the problem of other religions. They're under death but they're doing the best they can with the light they've been given, even though they're in unbelief and they're rejecting God, their creator. But th this view would say, well, that's not part of the light they're given. It's really hard to know if God exists and life is really busy. 
And so they're going along doing the best they can. That should be sufficient before God if God is just. So these men, the, thus men are by the second Adam restored to life again, that so by Adam's sin, they be none of them lose anything, which by their own righteousness, they might have a title to. For righteousness or an exact obedience to the law seems by the scripture to have a claim of right to eternal life. If you're righteous, you would have unending physical life. You haven't been, so Christ was for you, which will bring them to life again, and they shall put behind them all of those trials and have unending life. On the other side, it seems the unalterable purpose of the divine justice that no unrighteous person, no one that is guilty of any breach of the law, should be in paradise. But the wages of sin should be to every man, as it was to Adam, an exclusion of him from that happy state of immortality and bring death upon him. And this is so conformable to the eternal and established law of right and wrong that it is spoken of too as if it were could not be otherwise. So the unrighteous are expelled, and that's all of us. Christ gets to restore us back into paradise. That's the essence of Christianity. Here, then, we have the standing and fixed measure of life and death. Immortality and bliss belong to the righteous, those who live in an exact conformity to the law of God, or out of the reach of death. But an exclusion from paradise and loss of immortality is a portion of sinners. Of all those who have any way broken that law and failed of a complete obedience to it by the guilt of any one transgression. So that's Christianity. And he thinks that that's avoiding some of the objections to, say, Calvinism, but I think we're seeing some problems emerge. One, how do we even know there is a God? Second, how would Adam have known that? How would he have known he should keep this law from someone who's saying, don't eat of a tree? Why should I believe you? What does that even mean? And then death. What is death? The day you eat, you'll surely die physically. And as he says, he didn't die physically. They just started to die that day. So it's simply not true that you die that day. Why was that put on there instead of you'll start dying? And then that the other miseries of this life are part of being kicked out of the garden. That's why you're under misery. It almost as if, and this is a view that's out there, the Garden of Eden was a little island surrounded by a world of natural evil. So when you're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, then you're in natural evil. And if you could just get back in, you'd be out of natural evil. But not viewing natural evil as a callback for unbelief. That's the sin. He's mostly viewing sin here as a kind of an outward action, not getting to the inward spiritual nature of the law. Let me just say, uh, why did God make it so hard for mankind, this law? And the answer is, it was such a law as the purity of God's nature required. It must be the law of such a creature as man, unless God would have made him a rational creature and not required him to have lived by the law of reason, but would have countenanced in him irregularity and disobedience to that light which he had and that rule which was suitable to his nature, which would have been to have authorized disorder, confusion, and wickedness in his creatures. For that law was the law of reason, or as it is called of nature, as we shall see by and by. And if rational creatures will not live up to the rule of their reason, who shall excuse them? If you will admit them to forsake reason at any point, why not another? So because reason requires consistency, the law is rigorous. This doesn't connect up the law to our highest good. Maybe he might say the law is prudential and helps us be ha the happiest we can be because when you break the law, vices come in and harm you. But it doesn't connect up the law to the highest good of knowing the glory of God and his works. So now the law of faith. To better understand the law of faith, it will be convenient in the first place to consider the law of works. The law of works, then, in short, is that law which required perfect obedience without any remission or abatement, so that, by that law, a man cannot be just or justified without the exact performance of every tittle. 
And since we haven't done that, that's why we need Christ. So the language of the law is, do this and live, transgress and die. It's promising life and death, but we still don't have a satisfactory definition of those from Locke. And now he goes through some of this in Moses. The law given to Moses. And he has some wording here, which sounds like it comes out of the, the Westminster Larger Catechism. Whatever God requires anywhere to be done without making any allowance for faith, that is par a part of the law of works, so that forbidding Adam to eat of the tree of the knowledge was part of the law of works. Only we must take notice here that some of God's positive commands, being for pure ends and suited to particular circumstances of times, places, and persons, have a limited and only temporary obligation by virtue of God's positive injunction. So that's positive law. I was thinking of the Westminster Larger Catechism in terms of what is positively commanded, even if it doesn't tell you not to do the opposite, implies the opposite. The negative comes with it. Then he distinguishes the civil and ritual part of the law delivered deliver to Moses and what, when that applies or doesn't apply to Christians. And then the faith for which God justified at Abraham was simply this. It was believing God when he engaged his promise in the covenant he made with him. That was the faith of Abraham for which he was uh, commended. Now, what are we required now who believe to obtain eternal life? Well, it's plainly set down in the gospel. St. John tells us, John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, and he that believeth not on the Son hath not life. What this believing on him is, we are told in the next chapter. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, and when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. The woman then went into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man that, hold, that hath told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Messiah? And many of the Samaritans believed on him for the saying of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So believing that he's the Messiah is all that you need to do to obtain eternal life. Think about how much that shaped Christianity since Locke and in the American context, the American revivals. So by which place it is plain that believing on the Son is believing that Jesus is the Messiah, giving credit to the miracles he did in professing and the profession he made of himself. This is the great proposition that was then controverted concerning Jesus of Nazareth, whether he is the Messiah or not. And to convince men that he is, he did miracles. And so that's the role of miracles. They prove that he's the Messiah. Think about how much uh, Christian apologetics is still shaped by that. And that he was the Messiah was the great truth he took pains to convince his disciples and apostles of, appearing to them after his resurrection. And if we may gather that, gather what was to be believed by all nations from what he preached unto them, we, we may certainly know what they were commanded. To teach all nations by what they actually did teach all nations. So if you go into all the world and teach that Jesus is the Messiah. So he looks at how the apostles taught that Christ uh, is the Messiah. He goes through Acts here, which would be good if, if people are giving a sermon series on Acts. They could look over John Locke and see what he said and he, uh, what, the, what Stephen, Peter, Paul say. I'm going to scroll through this because I want to get to more about his specific understanding of uh, life and death. All of this is his using acts to prove that they that Jesus is the Messiah. Interestingly, here, Acts 17, Paul goes to the idolatrous Athenians, telling them, upon occasion of the altar, dedicated to the unknown God, whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God who made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, 
We ought not to think that God is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. And so he says, and so that we see where anything more was necessary to be proposed to be believed, as there was to the heathen idolaters, there the apostle was careful not to omit it. So that the idea is that all the Athenians needed, they didn't need philosophy, a, a philosophy lecture or a correction on, on, on their theology too much. All they needed is to believe that Christ is the Messiah, which is proven by his be, having been raised from the dead. So think again about Christian apologetics now focusing on either miracles or the resurrection of the dead. Let me scroll down here, continuing in uh, his biblical proofs of Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, from the New Testament, I don't think he'll get any doubt about that. And then he goes through three ways that he declared himself to be the Messiah. First, his by miracles, which he just mentioned. And then another way of declaring was by his phrases and circumlo circumlocutions that signify or intimate his coming as the Messiah. And then third, by plain and direct words, he simply declared himself to be the Messiah. He, he looks at the sense in which he sometimes concealed himself. I'm scrolling down for getting past the biblical part to what it means for this to be reasonable. So here is how did Christ promulgate the gospel in his own ministry where he showed that he's the Messiah who's come and what the Messiah does is restores us to the paradise Adam lost. So that gives an explanation of the reason of his method. Miracles. And going back to how John the Baptist proclaimed him to be the Messiah. Going through his parables, Matthew, Mark. We're skipping some of this because we want to get to ex more about his, the essence of Adam and death. And this promise, again, of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life, meaning, again, restoring to unending physical life. Hope it's not making you dizzy to scroll fast. I'm getting through it. Here he's going through in some detail about the Gospel of John. Now to their plot to crucify him. That would be, this is important to see. Uh, why do you have to die? Could he have come into the world and not died? He, his purpose was to declare to the world that he is the Messiah. And whoever follow, is a follower of truth receive this doctrine concerning him. But the Jews continue to persecute him.
here's a question that comes up. Did Christ have to die? And some people say no. The one answer that Christ had to die is because he's satisfying divine judgment. And so someone needs to be judged. It's going to be us, but then Christ steps in and takes that punishment. But this view is saying that this is one of the things he did to save us, but God had other options open that he could have done to save us besides Christ dying. So he's going through still crucifixion and resurrection. Last Passover, the Last Supper. And that in his la in the in the Last Supper, he's not giving them any new articles to believe other than what they believed before, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, sent from the Father. And then concluding in his prayer, that'll be in John 17. I'm going to scroll a little faster down here to the end of his crucifixion. So these two then, faith and repentance, believing Jesus to be the Messiah and a good life, are the indispensable conditions of the new covenant to be performed by all those who would obtain eternal life. The reasonableness, or rather necessity of which, that we may be the better comprehend, we must, uh, we must a little look back to what has been said in the beginning. Adam being the son of God, and so St. Luke calls him in chapter 338, had this part also of the likeness and image of the father. He was immortal. That's the death he's talking about. But Adam, transgressing the command given to him by his heavenly father, incurred the penalty. He forfeited the state of immortality and became mortal. And after this, he begot children who also were mortal. But God, nevertheless, out of his infinite mercy, willing to bestow eternal life on mortal men, physical life forever, sends Jesus Christ into the world, who, being conceived in the womb of a virgin, by the immediate power of God, was properly the son of God, according to what the angel declared unto his mother. So that being the son of God, he was like the father, immortal again. That's why he had to be born of, of God, like Adam was created by God. This immortality is a part of that image, wherein those were made like their father appears probable, not only from the places in Genesis concerning Adam, above taken notice of, but seems to me also to be intimated in some expressions concerning Jesus, the son of God. In the New Testament. So he's the firstborn. He's the image of God. He's immortal. And so he's doing a discussion about the immortality of the sons of God. Um, so he says, But that our Savior was so... He himself further declares in John 10, 18, where speaking of his life, he says, no one taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again, which he could not have had if he had been a mere mortal man. So instead he's not, he's immortal. For this laying down of his life for others, our Savior tells us, uh, John 10, 17, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. And this is obedience and suffering was rewarded with a kingdom. So it's not to satisfy the justice of God. And so it isn't triple imputation. Adam imputed to us uh, our sin to Christ. Christ's righteousness imputed to us. So he says, thus God, we see, designed his son, Jesus Christ, a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom in heaven, not on earth. And just as Adam died, and all in Adam all died, so in Christ shall all be made alive, and all men shall return to life again at that last day. Yet all men, having sinned and thereby come short of the glory of God, not attaining to the heavenly kingdom, which is called the glory of God. So interestingly, how, do, how does he understand the glory of God? Well, the glory of God is when you attain to the kingdom of God. You get to go live in the kingdom of God, as opposed to the glory of God is knowing the glory of God in his works. 
So this is the entrance into eternal life. Now here he says, uh, instead of entrance into eternal life in the kingdom that he prepared for them, though the sinners should receive death, the just reward of sin, which every one of them was guilty of. This second death uh, would have left him no subjects. And instead of those 10,000s times 10,000s and thousands of thousands, there would have been one, there would not have been one left to sing the praises unto his name. God, therefore, out of his mercy to mankind and for the erecting of the kingdom of his son and furnishing it with subjects out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, proposed to the children of men that as many of them as would believe Jesus, his son, to be the Messiah, the promised deliverer, would receive him for their king and ruler, should have all their past sins, disobedience, and rebellion forgiven them. And if for the future they lived in a sincere obedience to his law, to the utmost of their power, the sins of human frailty for the time to come, as well as those of their past lives, should, for his son's sake, because they gave themselves up to him to be his subjects, be forgiven them. So that's the whole story now of Christianity. And you can see how much of the way that Christianity has been understood from his time to ours is this story. God wanted people to sing his praises. Excuse me. But all of them had sinned, so he needed Christ to go and save them. And he simply forgives them if they believe in Christ. There's no connection between his justice being satisfied by the death of Christ. Goes over here, free grace of faith. For uh, life, eternal life, is the reward of justice or righteousness appointed by the righteousness of God. He goes over here why people need to keep the law of God. That if you really declare him to be your king, you keep his laws. If you're not keeping his laws, you don't really declare him as your king. So the faith required is to believe Jesus to be the Messiah. You can see how this fits with his, his letter on toleration. The, a lot of other stuff gets added on to Christianity. It's not what you need for salvation. All you need is to believe Jesus to be the Messiah who was promised by God to the world. So he's going to go here more into some of how the scriptures show this. I want to go to the end of this section. Uh, here he's covering how the scriptures show the need for obedience to the law of God, even for those who have, have uh, justified by grace or by faith alone through grace. Grace alone through faith. So now to the last judgment. Uh, here, here he has an objection. If all sinners shall be condemned, but such as have a gracious allowance made them, and so are justified by God for believing Jesus to be the Messiah, and so take him for their king, whom they resolved to obey to the utmost of their power, what shall become of all mankind who lived before Jesus, who never heard of his name? And to this the answer is so obvious and natural that one would wonder how any reasonable man should think it worth the urging. Nobody was or can be required to believe what was never proposed to him. Before the fullness of time, when God, from the counsel of his own wisdom, had appointed to send his son, he had, at several times and in diverse manners, promised to the people of Israel an extraordinary person to come, a ruler and deliverer. All right, so that's for Israel. Let's see what he says about everybody else. So the idea is 
They had been promised that he would show up. And God, out of his infinite mercy, cannot as well justify men now for believing Jesus of Nazareth as those heretofore who believed only that God would, according to his promise in due time, send a Messiah. So it's still going to be dependent on your access to knowledge of special revelation. If you didn't have access to it at all, you couldn't be judged on that basis. So what about those who have never, who lived before Christ and before any scriptures? And that's where he says, according to what a man has and not according to what he has not is what they're judged for. So no sense of a clear general revelation, a failure to know God, the eternal power and divine nature of God. And that's what they're condemned for. The law is eternal, immutable standard of right. And a part of that law is that man should forgive not only his own children, but his enemies. And therefore, he could not doubt that the author of this law and God of patience and consolation, who is rich in mercy, would forgive his frail offspring. So that's the way he's arguing from general revelation to the idea of forgiveness. So he says, the works of nature in every part of them sufficiently evidence a deity, yet the world made so little use of their reason that they saw him not, where even by the impressions of himself, he was easy to be found. Sense and lust blinded their, the minds in some, and a careless inadvertency in others, and fearful apprehensions in most, gave them up into the hands of their priests to fill their heads with false notions of deity, and their worship with foolish rites as they pleased. And what dread or craft once began, devotion soon made sacred. So here he's describing the rise of false religion and affirming that the works of nature sufficiently evidence who God is to make these without excuse. Hence, we see that reason, speaking ever so clearly to the wise and virtuous, had never authority enough to prevail on the multitude and to persuade the societies of men that there was but one God that alone was to be owned and worshipped. So the insufficiency of reason due to these other considerations. And if that's true, how can you be judged for it? Uh, we find one Socrates amongst them that opposed and laughed at polytheism. So they do, they hold up Greek and Roman thinkers who, who affirmed one God, even though they generally didn't think of this God as a creator. They thought of him more in a dualistic fashion. And he goes over again, uh, Paul in Acts 17, where he tells the Athenians that they and the rest of the world, whatever light there was in the works of creation and providence to lead them to the true God, yet few of them found him, but he was everywhere near them. So here's a strange conflict. God is near them, but he gives some excuses of why they didn't find him. So the clear revelation he brought with him dissipated this darkness and made the one invisible true God known to the world. Well, that's hard to figure out because they, he says, you don't know me or my father. So it's interesting, general revelation and reason didn't make God clear, but Jesus coming and declaring God did make God clear, even though part of what Jesus says is, you don't know me or my father. He mentions Islam here and how Islam derived its teaching from Christianity. Now he goes to how we know there's one God and the rise of polytheism. Anyone shall think to excuse human nature by laying blame on men's negligence that they do not carry morality to a higher pitch and make it out entire in every part with that clearness of demonstration which some think it capable of, he helps not the matter. Be the cause of what it will, our Savior found mankind under a corruption of manners and principles which ages after had prevailed, which age after age had prevailed and must be confessed 
was not in a way or tendency to be mended. The rules of morality were in different countries and sects different. And natural reason nowhere had cured, nor was like to cure, the defects and errors of them. So reason can't cure us. Now that's ambiguous because I would say, yes, reason teaches you morality and teaches you what you should do. He has a kind of voluntarist view here where the will operates independent of the intellect and say, no, that's not true. What you believe is good is what you do and you use reason to know what is good, but you can't be forgiven because in the justice of God, you've sinned and are justly condemned. But Christ takes that condemnation, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So you can't be saved by reason, but the fact that you need to be saved presupposes reason. So yeah, the outward forms of worshiping the deity and the need to reform them. Um, I'll come down here to the end of this section. All right, so that's right here. Um, So Jesus is a promised deliverer due to the corruption and misery that the frailty of man leads to. So it's almost like humans are frail. That leads them to sin. The frailty includes their own reason, which therefore can't help them because it's frail. And Jesus is their deliverer. All they need to do is, is believe that, and then they're forgiven. But there's no sense in here of their culpability that... They can and should have known God. Their frailty is, comes after the fall. They can and should have known God. Due to their unbelief, they fell to the temptation, and natural evil was imposed on them as a call back to stop and think. But they're under the judgment of God. Christ, as the Lamb of God, takes that judgment, and then they're able to be forgiven. That's not here at all. No, no mention there of the justice of God in that sense. Just that Christ is the deliverer, and God did it this way. He may have done it some other way if he pleased, but this happens to be the way he did it. So is this the essence of Christianity? Is this a reasonable view of Christianity compared to other more strict views, puritanical views, or other religions even? Is this reasonable? It, it, it accords to Locke's understanding and his assumptions, but let me finish with naming some of his assumptions. He's an empiricist who thinks that all knowledge is from the senses. He applies this to our ability to know God. Now, in his book, Essays Concerning Human Understanding, he goes through some impressive proofs for God's existence. Uh, book four, chapter 10, I believe. But he then dismisses them even by saying that humans are, most humans are too busy to do that kind of thinking. His view of the highest good in life is happiness due to our condition of being in paradise. That's what God will restore us to if we believe in the Messiah. Heaven, paradise. In Locke, there's no sense of our goal is to know God in all that by which he makes himself known in all of his works of creation and providence. Our highest good is to know God. And that's done here. The, the misery on the world in the form of natural evil is a call to stop and think and direct us to our need for redemption in Christ, the Lamb of God. And that that redemption extends to the whole world, which is transformed in the renewing of the mind to know who God is. That's a different vision than the vision of dying and going to heaven or paradise again. So we can ask the standard for reasonableness is the wrong standard. That's more like the standard of what persuades me. What persuades me might be due to a lot of limitations of my own thinking. What we want to know is, is it indeed true that God exists, that it's clear God exists, and that our highest good is in knowing him 
And that also would help us with the definition of death, by the way. Death would be the opposite, not knowing him. So Locke, John Locke and the reasonableness of Christianity.